Uh, in just a few moments, I'm going to ask you to look at the second letter to the Thessalonians. That's kind of later in the New Testament if you're looking for a place to turn uh, in the Scripture. We're going to be there in just a moment. Uh, but I want to remind you of what, <clears throat> what I reminded you of the first time that I began this series called Afterlife. And that is, is that the afterlife matters. Uh, I just got back uh, from a few days in the Dominican Republic and was speaking there um, at an outreach where there were <clears throat> a couple of hundred uh, former baseball coaches, some uh, former major league players, some current major league players um, who were there going to do camps for, you know, probably 5,000 Dominican kids. And I have an opportunity to share the gospel and those kinds of things. But the island was still reeling a little bit because uh, one of their baseball players, uh, Oscar Tavares, who plays for, uh, played for the St. Louis Cardinals and came in this year, kind of later in the year as a rookie and made an incredible impression just a couple of weeks ago, um, was killed in a car accident in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> And this was a native son and someone that they loved very dearly, but there's a lot going on in the minds of people when someone who's, what, 21 or so years old um, is killed in a car accident, and it was, um, alcohol was involved, and in fact, excessive alcohol was involved. But here's the thing. Something happened to him. Something happened to him. There is an eternal reality at play because he died, as best we understand, without knowing God, without having trusted in Christ. I don't know his heart, I don't know any of those things, but I'm telling you this, that the afterlife matters. It, it matters not least because this life, the life that we live right now matters and has consequence for the life to come or the non-life to come. And so, we talk about a serious subject when we're talking about the afterlife, and we had the opportunity in week number one to talk about the beauty and the richness of kind of the centrality of resurrection, that we kind of build an idea of the afterlife for those that are believers around this idea of resurrection. Last week, Pastor Dion shared a great message talking about the reality of judgment. And these are things, by the way, when we talk about these ideas, the resurrection and judgment, and now today talking about the subject of hell, these are subjects that avoidance doesn't do us any good. If we want to just avoid the hard subjects in the scripture, well, <clears throat> we're doing a disservice to the people of God when we do that. And so I would suggest to you that uh, this is a subject that makes me shudder, and it should you as well. This is not something that I would treat lightheartedly or lightly because it matters. Now, I realize that some of you may be here for the very first time ever, that you're a guest today and you're going, man, I walked in and you're talking about hell. Do you do that often? Every week, this is what we talk about. <laughs> Obviously not. This is a part of a series that we're doing talking about the afterlife, and what I would encourage you to do is maybe, if you're brand new here, go back to thechapel.com and check out a couple, of message, a couple of the messages so far, and then there's one more to come next week where we talk about the new heavens and new earth. And so this is a part of the sweep of talking about this, this idea of the afterlife, and if you're a guest today, um, you might say, boy, I picked the wrong day to come for the first time. Actually, not at all. I think you picked a great day to come for the first time. Because oftentimes when you're dealing with a subject that's heavy or that's hard or that's anything like this, you get a good indication of what a church is like or what the teaching is like in how hard subjects are treated. And so I think you've come on a good day. And, uh, and I'm thankful that you're, that you're here. But I want you to know that we'll treat this subject with both seriousness and humility because truth is there's a lot that we may or may not know. There's some things that we do know based on the scripture. There's also some things that we don't know um, truthfully. And so I'll try and handle that with both the seriousness and the humility that's necessary in the context of scripture. And there's also through the course of 2000 years of church history, there's a few different um, ideas of what hell is uh, that stay within the realm of what we would call orthodoxy. 
uh, people that genuinely believe the scripture and this comes from the scripture as best they understand. And there's a few ways of, of viewing it that, uh, that people that love the Lord may see it slightly differently. And I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. There's also a way of viewing it that, um, that travels outside the stream of what we would call orthodoxy. And I'll mention that as well. So I want us to take just a moment and I want to begin in 2 Thessalonians chapter number one and we're going to read the first 10 verses and then we're going to spend some time unpacking that. So here's what it says beginning in verse number one. It says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith and all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you, because you believed our testimony to you. So Father, as we enter into a time where we spend thinking about what it is you have communicated to us through the scripture, I pray that we would have receptive hearts to what you want to say to us, and even the consequence and the action involved in what you say to us. Father, I pray that you'd guide my mind and my heart, my tongue, and that, God, you'd give us all an opportunity to hear from you. It's you that we need to hear from. It's you that we need to make much of. And so, God, even though this is a a tough subject, for us sometimes to think about and to talk about. I pray today that you would allow a freshness of our minds and our hearts to have a vision of you, God, that's consistent with the nature of who you are. And that God, whether we have heard next to no teaching about this subject or if we've heard teaching about this subject that wasn't very good, or if we've heard good teaching about this subject, but the spirit behind the teaching wasn't very good. I pray that you'd reshape our minds and you'd reshape our hearts by your spirit, through your word. And we trust you to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul's writing here in the book of, the second book of Thessalonians, he's writing to a persecuted people, as you see when you're reading the text itself. He talks about their suffering and that being at the hands of people who are persecuting them. And so it makes sense that what Paul is doing in 2 Thessalonians is he's actually writing a letter to say to the people that are being persecuted by people that stand opposed to the gospel or stand opposed to God. He's writing a letter to say God is actually going to work all these things out. That's what he's saying. God's going to work all of these things out. You don't have to be totally freaked out because he's going to work these things out. Now, what Paul does when he opens up this passage is he talks about how God is going to deal with those who have persecuted you and who have made you suffer and all of those things because God ultimately is a just God and he's going to deal with these things properly. And then what he describes He describes kind of the consequence or the outcome that we might call hell, but he never uses the term in the passage that we just read. The the term is used in a number of different places through the course of Scripture, that's for certain. And in fact, it has a number of different variations, whether we're talking about Sheol, which means the grave, really not translated hell, or Hades, or Tartarus, or Gehenna. Um, We've got a number of different ways and views in which the term that we use, one term, hell, describes sometimes many different things. And the fact is that you have to kind of unpack what's being said in what place. 
I've done that before, and I've done that in teaching here before, but today I'm going to take a little bit of a different vantage point. Because this passage actually doesn't use the term hell, so it shouldn't be as uh, confusing for us. It just describes the consequence thereof and describes the activities thereof. So he positions this teaching, Paul does, to persecuted people, but also positions it in a way where he says, ultimately, this justice is going to be meted out at the time of Jesus' coming or the time of his appearing. So you remember that we've actually spent time the last couple of weeks talking about that being kind of the cataclysmic event where all of these things occur. The idea of resurrection occurring when Christ appears. The idea of judgment after that time as well. And now situated here, we talk about, we're kind of situating this in the time of his appearing when both, the scripture says, the righteous and the unrighteous are resurrected and then face this idea of judgment. So there's a few things that I want to pull out of this passage for us today that I think will be helpful for us at least in learning and understanding the nature of this doctrine. And I, I want to begin by just highlighting this idea. Here's the first thing. That God is just and his judgment is right. This is the first thing that I want to pull out of our text today because Paul actually affirms this with the church at Thessalonica, that God is just and his judgment is right. I want us to reread verses 3 through 7 just at the very beginning there. Listen to what it says. We ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more, and the love all of you have for one another is increasing. Boy, wouldn't it be great if that's just said of our congregation? that the love that we have for one another is increasing. That's a wonderful testimony that Paul has initiated there. Then it says in verse four, therefore among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials you are enduring. So they're going through a difficult time. There's no question about that. They are loving one another in the midst of their difficulty. Instead of difficulty and persecution driving them away from one another, they're actually loving each other more and more even in the midst of the trials that they're facing. Then it says in verse five, all this is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. And this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. Now, it makes really good sense that what Paul is doing here to these persecuted believers is he's teaching them to trust in God's justice. In other words, he's saying, listen, God is going to sort these things out. You are being troubled. You are being persecuted. But don't misunderstand. God's not just going to kind of passively wink at all this. God is not just going to say, yeah, anything goes because God is just and his judgments are are right. This is what Paul's trying to affirm. So when God deals with those who oppose the gospel, those who oppose God, and those who oppose anybody who represents the gospel, God is right in doing that because God is just and his judgments are right. Now what I find Paul doing here that may or may not have jumped out at you is I find Paul actually repeating some of the teaching of Jesus. Uh, Paul does that, by the way, a lot. If you will read some of Paul's writings and you will think about, as you read it, the teaching of Jesus as best you know it and understand it, you will find so much of Paul being a recapitulation of things that Jesus taught and said. Maybe Paul is framing them slightly differently. Maybe he is using different language. But he's actually repeating often what Jesus taught. And here, when he's talking about those who are being persecuted that are followers, that are disciples of Jesus, and how God is going to deal out justice for the righteous, and he's going to deal out justice for the wicked. This is repeating one of the parables that Jesus taught. You might remember it. It's in Matthew chapter 25. If you don't remember it, let's uh, take a look at it. It says this, beginning in verse number 31. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. 
He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat and I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat, and I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in, and I needed clothes and you did not clothe me, and I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. And they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? And he will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. You see, this passage of scripture is often uh, misunderstood and actually, I think, misinterpreted because it's used oftentimes to simply say that um, if you don't help poor people, you're going to hell. That's a misunderstanding of this text. Now, by the way, God is immensely in favor of helping the poor. There is no doubt that as you read the entirety, both the Hebrew scripture and the New Testament, that God makes a case for being a defender of those who are marginalized in society, and he calls those who know Christ to be people on the front line of helping people who are marginalized or poor or hurting or whatever. That is clear, and there are immense images in the scripture and direct teaching in the scripture about that. But this isn't one of those. This isn't one of those. Because until we understand who Jesus is referring to, we don't understand the parable. Because what Jesus says is he refers to whatever you did to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine. Until you understand who he is referring to in that context, you don't fully understand the parable that's being written. And what we know reading the Gospel of Matthew is that we know Jesus has referred to his brothers and sisters oftentimes. In fact, in Matthew chapter number 12, listen to how Jesus described that. It says Jesus was speaking, still talking to a crowd and his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. And someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. And he replied to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. Did you hear that? This is to whom Jesus is referring. When he talks about his brothers and sisters, he's referring to all of those who do the will of God, who are followers of his, who trust in him to be reconciled to the Father. These are his mother and his brothers and his sisters. In fact, just a a little bit prior to that, you get some sense in Matthew chapter 10 that Jesus is talking about how he rewards those who treat his disciples well, and he disciplines those who treat them poorly. Listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 10. If anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you that person will certainly not lose their reward. You see, what Jesus is getting at in his teaching, both in the parables and otherwise, is he's saying this. Although there is myriad examples in the entirety of Scripture for helping the poor, and we should, and that is a a subject for another day and something we've talked about often here, although that is the case, this parable is saying that God is just and that he is going to deal justly with people. And if there are those who have persecuted his brothers and sisters, that they have now gone without clothing, that they have now been imprisoned, that they have now suffered because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, that's not gonna get by me. I'm gonna deal with that. I'm gonna reward those who followed me and those who have stood in opposition. 
Those who have rejected, I'm going to deal with them as well. Why? Because God, Paul is saying, is just, and his judgments are right. This is foundational to how we understand the doctrine that we're dealing with today. Now, it's important to Paul that God's judgments are right, and he wants to communicate to that to people who are being persecuted and who are suffering. Because, listen, because God may not in that moment demonstrate his justice, it might be delayed, but it's coming. In fact, that's why Paul situates the context of this around the Lord's coming. Uh, at his appearing. He's going to deal with this. You may not feel it now. You may not sense it now, but he is going to deal with this when Christ appears, as the scripture says, with his powerful angels. Then he is going to deal with all these things. So you can rest knowing that God's the one who's going to sort these things out. And part of the reason he was reminding them that God is just and his judgments are right is the same reason we need to be reminded. Here's why. Because you and I, we cannot see justice perfectly clearly. We're sin scarred. We're stained. We can't fully separate our ego or our anger or our pride or our hurt or our compassion. We can't sort all of that. We can't just push all of that to the side. All of that is playing in, and by the way, all of it is somehow sin-tainted because we are imperfect, and we cannot understand justice completely perfectly, which is why I think it's interesting because Paul wants to remind them that God is just and his judgments are right because they can't see justice perfectly, but wouldn't it be something if we could see justice perfectly? Wouldn't it be something if we were able to see that in some way, the way that God sees that? Well, do you know that we sort of have that testimony already in the scripture? Because there are people, listen, there are people that are recorded in the book of Revelation who have died and their souls have gone on to be with the Lord. Remember we talked about that idea, right? They're not yet at a time of the resurrection of the body, but their souls have gone to be in the presence of the Lord. They're no longer encumbered by sin. They're no longer encumbered by flesh. They are now purified, so to speak, in a sense, in the presence of Jesus. And do you know what? They could see justice clearly. In fact, listen to their testimony. In Revelation chapter number six, it says this, when he, the lamb, opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. Listen to this, people who had been persecuted for the sake of the gospel, which is what Paul is getting at, right? And he sees their souls under the altar. Then notice what it says. It says, they called out in a loud voice, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Wow. That's startling, isn't it? But here's the thing. Here's what we know. They are calling out, how long until your justice is demonstrated? Because now they were seeing it very clearly that God, he's just, and sin, it is wicked. And God, his judgments are right. And so they are saying, how long until you enact what you are and what you should do? And in fact, we see the same kind of testimony in Revelation chapter 19. And it says this, after this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again, they shouted, hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. These are people who are now purified, who've got a real sense of God's own justice. And here's what they're saying. His justice, his judgment, it's right. We might be a little cloudy on it, but they're not cloudy on it. And so Paul is reminding us here in this passage that God is just and his judgments are right. And by the way, Jesus reminds us that even at the time of the resurrection, it's going to be so obvious, it's not even funny how right his judgments are. 
That at the time when the resurrected, uh, those that are resurrected to life and those, the unrighteous are resurrected, it's gonna be painfully obvious. So obvious, in fact, that there will be generations that he raises from the dead that will actually testify to how right his judgments are. In fact, when Jesus showed up among people, he was preaching the gospel to them and they were non-respondent. And do you know what he said to them? Listen to these words in Luke chapter number 11. And it says this, as the crowds increase, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. It asked for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, so also will the son of man be to this generation. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with the people of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Noah. And now something greater than Noah is here. You know what Jesus is getting at? He's saying, listen, at the resurrection, I'm not even going to have to probably say a whole lot because everybody else is going to testify to how right my judgments are. Every generation, they're going to testify. This is strong words, and Paul sets the tone in this passage by saying to us that God is just and his judgment is right. Let me give you a second thing. Hell is the description of God's judgment against those who have rejected him. That's what we're going to see here. Even though the term is not used, hell is a description of God's judgment against those who've rejected him. Listen to how he unpacks this again in verse number 8, 9, and 10. Paul says, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, and they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you have believed our testimony to you. If you remember when I began this series, and if you're a guest, you don't remember because this is your first run in here. But if you remember when I began this series, what I said is, is there, there are, I'm going to talk to you about those who are believers and remind you of two things, that there is life after death and there is life after life after death, right? We talked about that being the idea of resurrection. Well, what we're being reminded of here is that there is actually death after death. For those who are unrighteous, there's death after death because you die and then ultimately there's a time of resurrection of the unrighteous for judgment and ultimately condemnation. And so the scripture says, Paul says it this way, that they'll be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. If that is not a sobering truth, I don't know what one is. This is not something that you preach with glee. This is not something that you teach with frivolity. This is serious. Everlasting destruction. So we have to ask the question, what does everlasting destruction, as it talks about here in verse 9, what does that look like? Well, there are really kind of three arenas in which people who have believed in what we would call an orthodox way through 2,000 years of Christianity there are kind of three ways of looking at this idea of everlasting destruction that would be considered orthodox, even though they're slightly different from one another. The first one is that what everlasting destruction means is eternal conscious torment. That's what some would argue for, and certainly there are passages in the scripture that give you that kind of indication. Eternal conscious torment. In fact, I want you to listen to the words of Mark chapter 9. Jesus says these words, If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. Jesus is using what we would call hyperbolic language here. He's not, um, he's not a proponent of cutting off limbs and poking out eyes. Okay, He's using hyperbole to make his point. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. 
Now, uh, those who have been here at the chapel for any length of time at all have heard me um, answer the question when someone has asked it. Do you think that the idea of fire is a literal understanding, in the, is hell literally fire? To which I have responded emphatically, of course not. That's not at all what I believe the scripture is talking about. Fire is used metaphorically all through the course of scripture, and I don't think that this is describing something literal, but I do take the same position as guys like Jonathan Edwards before me, who said that wherever the scripture uses metaphor, that just means that it can't be described. So it's probably worse. I mean, can you think of something? Because by the way, there are mixed metaphors even in the same context of scripture sometimes. Think about it. The fire, and it's also called sometimes in the same context, outer deepest darkness. Well, you can't have literal fire and darkness at the same time, okay? So just to make sure that you understand that, if you're taking both of those things literally, you can't have fire and darkness at the same time, right? Because fire yields light. The idea here is, is a bad scenario. So what is said in this passage is this, is the fire never dies out and the worm, the worm never dies and the fire is not quenched. The idea there, at least that it leads us toward, is the idea of a perpetual kind of existence. This was referencing something that would have been familiar to the people there because whenever there was a, either a garbage dump or a place where sometimes bodies were strewn and laid and those kinds of things, as gross as it sounds, and forgive me, but worms ate carcasses. That's what they did. If there were no carcasses to eat, the worms died because the worms lived on eating carcasses. Jesus is using kind of a metaphor here to kind of give us an understanding that there is somewhat of a a worm never dies and the fire never dies out kind of perpetual time frame, okay? So that's one idea, this, this idea of kind of eternal conscious existence in a place where the scripture calls shut out from the presence of the Lord as Paul describes it. There's a second way of understanding this idea and that is that there are degrees of torment that end in perpetual disintegration or destruction. I use that term in parentheses, I'll tell you why in just a second. Degrees of torment that end in perpetual disintegration. So people have asked me before, Jerry, do you think that hell actually has degrees? You remember, those of you who've read the classics, you read Dante and his Inferno, and he had this idea basically that there were levels of hell. And of course, some of that was a little you know, overplayed and somewhat dramatic. Uh, but at the same time, the scripture gives indication that there very well may be, and there, very, there surely are, degrees of punishment based upon things that have gone on. You say, really? Yeah, really. In fact, uh, I want you to listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 10. It says, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. He's talking to his disciples. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Hmm. He's actually talking about degree, is he not? And then listen to what it says in Matthew 11. Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down to Hades. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. The, the idea there that's being communicated is there's, there's some degree in which there are differing levels of judgment that are meted out when justice is served. This is a sobering fact as well when we begin to think about it because ultimately it also is reflective of the kind of people that we are. And if we choose to abandon relationship with God through Jesus Christ and say no to God's Son, then if we step into eternity where the scripture actually says that we will be shut out from the presence of God in what is called 
everlasting destruction. Understand that that word destruction, though it sometimes means complete and total annihilation, many times it means something different. It means something more like disintegration or a rendered uselessness. Which means that C.S. Lewis may not have been far off when he was writing The Great Divorce and he was writing kind of a fanciful picture which he claimed, he did not claim to be theology, nor should you try and make it such. But a fanciful description of what heaven and hell was and his description of hell had people that were continually, listen to this, because of their hanging on to their sin, they continually became more and more and more of what they hang on to. That they made gods instead of God. And those things begin to disintegrate them, eroding the image of God in them to the point that they actually become subhuman type of creatures existing eternally that can neither be shown compassion nor pity. They are beyond all of it. A subhuman existence for eternity, shut out from the presence of God, so to speak even though we know God is omnipresent, but shut out from the fellowship of God's presence. It is a sobering reality. But there's a third way that kind of Christians through the years have looked at this, and that's the way of annihilation. Listen to Matthew 10, verse 28. It says this, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, again, I mentioned to you already that that idea of destroy, even when Paul uses the term eternal destruction, does not necessarily mean annihilation. It very well means and can mean and it and does mean in some context in the scripture uselessness, a disintegration. But it also can mean at times the idea of complete and total annihilation. So they would argue that, that hold this kind of idea where when the term is used eternal destruction, they would argue that this is not about a function of time, that the destruction doesn't happen eternally, that the destruction's consequences are eternal. Now, I, I hold less probably to that view than I do to the second one, but I will say this, that there are people within the context of orthodoxy all through 2,000 years who have held on to each of these three ideas when it comes to what we view regarding hell. Here's what I would suggest to you. They are all bad. Whatever we're looking at there, and there's some, some things we just don't know, none of it is good. It is all sobering and heartbreaking, and it is not even God's desire, because the scripture is clear that God's desire is that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. That's what he longs for. But we know that we have been created in his image, which means that we bear the stamp of freedom because God is free. He is a free being. And to be created in his image means that we have some measure of freedom. And that has to do with a freedom even to reject him. C.S. Lewis said that hell is the greatest monument to human freedom ever constructed. Because we can choose to abandon relationship with God, say no to God, and as a result of that, have exactly what we ask for. So this is basically what Paul is getting at when he talks about the idea of eternal destruction and being shut out of the presence of God. But here's the thing. Even though all of these ideas that I just mentioned to you are within the realm of orthodoxy, there are some that go outside the realm of orthodoxy, and it would be an idea that, that theologians we would call universalism. What that idea is that has been popularized even recently in, in some writing, uh, kind of on a popular scale, is the idea that everyone given enough time, whether in this life or in the life to come, will actually be a part of God's family. Because, as has been said, love wins. Now, I want to remind you of something that um, I categorically reject that idea. Because there's a number of reasons why. Number one, because I don't think you can make an argument without absolutely obliterating scripture for that particular posture. You will have to actually cause the scripture either to be something that you don't base your thoughts in 
or you will have to twist it to places that it was never intended to go. And by the way, it is very difficult, even interestingly enough, by some who are theologians that have a bent toward universalism, they confess very readily that their benchmark is not actually scripture. They really can't benchmark their position based upon that. Which means then that that position is going to be based on conjecture, and I'm not okay with conjecture. I want to root it in a place that I have a confidence in, and that is the Spirit of God leading people who were either associates of Jesus, apostles or disciples of Jesus, or associates of those apostles, who were led by the Spirit to write the teaching out of the way in which Jesus was communicating it. And frankly, there was just no universalistic thought when Jesus was communicating these things. There, were, there was one kind of, um, uh, kind of outlier church father named Origen who kind of embraced some of that, but he was quickly called out and called down by the greater body of believers who said, no, no, that's not where it's going to, going to land. So there are a number of reasons this is the case. Also, the reason I reject this is because it sets up this kind of false paradox about God's justice versus God's love and that God's love is gonna beat God's justice. God is just, it's who he is. God is love, it's who he is. There's not a fight between them because all of God's justice is rooted in love. And God's justice and his judgments are right. This is what Paul was arguing for. I would also suggest to you the reason this doesn't make any sense is because oftentimes people are trying to say the reason that they want to believe this, the reason that they have to believe this, is because it makes God more loving. Actually, it doesn't. It actually serves the exact opposite purpose, which we'll see in just a second. It doesn't make God more loving. Even though that's what we, we are trying to project on God, our idea of God, instead of letting God say to us through the revelation of scripture, here's the deal, deal with it. And we try and make God more loving by saying, well, everybody's gonna be fine, really? We don't have to worry about that. Which absolutely guts the reality of the great commission that Jesus gave us and says, well, it really doesn't make any difference. I don't know what Jesus is even talking about. Why is he continuing to talk about these kinds of ideas and give us warnings about those kinds of things and talking about life versus death? You can't gut the words of Jesus. This is God the Son. And you can't set up some kind of false paradigm because we projected on God and said, you know what, uh, this is a way that I can make God more loving to people. Actually, it doesn't. We'll see that in just a second. Let me give you the last thing. Paul's talking about God's just and his judgment is right, and then he describes hell as God's judgment against those who've rejected him. And the last thing is this, that the gospel is good news precisely because there is bad news. And I want you to see it in the text. Look at verse number eight, it says this. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the good news, that's what gospel means, the good news of our Lord Jesus. Now pause with me for just a second. We're gonna try and land this plane here in a moment. If I could back us up, here's what I want you to understand. The image of God was created in humanity. This is God creating everything, creating icons or image bearers of himself. Male and female, he created them. And they were stamped with the image of God. Unlike anything else that was created, humanity was stamped with the image of God. But what sin did is it marred or eroded the image of God in humanity. Every one of us has been scarred by sin. Every one of us is a sinner by nature and by choice. Every one of us has been scarred by sin. We have come short of the glory of God. We have failed. We have missed the mark. Every single person. And so as a result of that, what sin does is sin goes to war now with humanity. Sin wars against true humanity because God made us truly human. But sin wars against humanity and sin also wars against the image of God in humanity because that's what sin does. Sin destroys and it enslaves and it kills. This is what sin does, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, it does in a number of different ways. What it functionally does is sin wants to cause us to make other idols or other gods instead of God. That's what sin does. It, it moves us to a place of wanting to create other gods other than God. In fact, this is the testimony of Romans chapter one. Listen to what it says. Although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. 
Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. You see, here's the deal. Sin wants to enslave us by causing us to build for ourselves other gods. Now, maybe it's a god in our own making. Maybe it's a god of money. Maybe it's a god of a relationship. Here's the thing. Everybody worships something. That's why atheism, for me, is intellectually dishonest. Because everyone worships something. Maybe they worship themselves. Maybe they worship their intellect. Maybe they worship their love relationships. They worship something. That's why atheism has always been, for me, intellectually dishonest, because everyone worships something. And if we create these false gods in our hearts, they will enslave us, ladies and gentlemen. They will enslave us by guilt, because if we can't get our idol, we feel guilty. They will enslave us by anger. In other words, if anything's in the way of us getting our idol, we'll be mad about it. We will be enslaved by fear because if anything threatens our idols, maybe our idol is money, and if something threatens it, we live in fear. Or maybe we'll be enslaved by compulsion. In other words, we must have this thing. But any way you slice it, whether it is guilt or anger or fear or compulsion, we are enslaved by sin. It's how, it's how sin works. And so think about this. God's wrath stands against enslavement and sin precisely because God loves so much. God's wrath stands against sin because God loves so much. You know full well, ladies and gentlemen, that wrath comes from love. You're going, I don't know. Oh, yeah, think about it for just a second. Think about it. Pause. Sir, you're walking with your family. Someone tries to attack your family. What comes out of you? Wrath. You know why? Because there is an attempt at the destruction of that which you love. Wrath comes from that. But wrath comes from love. You see, wrath is not the opposite of love. Indifference is. You just don't care. Wrath comes from love. You, you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, you think about when you watch on the news and you see little children in the Middle East who are being beheaded for the sole reason that they were born into a family who follows Jesus. That is happening. You're seeing it. And what rises up in you? A wrath that demands justice. That things need to be set right. Why? Because of love. Because that's where wrath comes from. True wrath, God's wrath, comes from God's great love. You see, this is something that we need to be able to understand. And listen, if we as sinful people can understand what it feels like to have a wrath that comes from love for people that we care about and we love, how much more a holy, sinless, spotless God feels when sin wrecks and destroys and comes against everything that he has made? How much more? If we as sinful people can feel that, how about an infinitely holy God who feels that, who senses that, who knows that? You see, ladies and gentlemen, this is the beauty of the gospel. The reason the gospel ultimately is good news is precisely because there is bad news. That means that in the midst of this wrath, that what God is doing is because of his great love for us, he is dealing in wrath against sin because God is just and his judgments are right. That's why when Jesus showed up, perfectly holy, sinless and spotless, 
He went to a cross and he experienced hell in his body in the form of crucifixion. And he experienced hell in his soul in the form of rejection. Rejection by people that he loved and followed and helped and served and healed. And rejection, listen, by God. You go, wait a second. Yeah, wait a second. Listen to the words of Jesus on the cross, ladies and gentlemen. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? As he's quoting the words of Psalm 22, listen closely. It is the only time Jesus ever referred to his father as anything other than father. Here he refers to him on the cross as God, not as father. Why? Because he wasn't speaking to his father. He was speaking to his judge. Because of your sin and my sin. Jesus, listen, Jesus endured hell for you. Jesus endured hell instead of you. This is the marvel of God's great love for us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That we would not have to experience being shut out from the presence of God, but that Jesus would rip wide open our opportunity to be reconciled to the Father because of God's great love for us. That's why I don't want you to misunderstand. God's love and his justice are not in a fight. God's love and his justice flow out from the the nature of who he is. And God has satisfied his justice and his love in the person of Jesus. And if we trample that underfoot and we say no, well, Paul says there is an outcome for that. And that you get to experience the justice that you could have avoided by putting your faith and trust in Jesus. It's sobering. So how do we act? How do we feel about this? What does this doctrine teach us? Well, it better teach us the height of God's grace and the depth of God's love for sinners such as us, that God would go to this extent to show us his great grace and his immeasurable love so that we'd be reconciled to him. This is his desire. But it should also do this. It should also motivate us to share the love of Christ with people around us. It doesn't mean when we share the gospel with them that we lead with hell. In fact, none of the apostles actually led with hell. Hey, I want to talk to you, because you're going to hell. (laughs) Right? None of the apostles actually ever led that way. But here's what, I know I said something funny, and it was worth a laugh, but listen, hell is no laughing matter. We know that. It could not be more serious. God is just, and his judgments are right. And all creation is going to testify to that. Even generations that have died are going to testify to that at the resurrection. But God's immeasurable love has been shown to us in Jesus Christ who went to a cross to satisfy the justice of God against sin, your sin, my sin. That if we put our faith in him, we stand under the umbrella of God's grace and the tidal wave of his wrath doesn't touch us because it's been poured out on his son. What staggering love is that? It's staggering for us. This ought to motivate us to share the love of Christ with the people around us, to compel them by the love of Christ to come to him, to say to them, the afterlife matters, but this life matters. And the choices that we make in this life have consequence for the life to come. And there there really is a judgment to come. There really is a just God who's going to deal justly with all humanity, and he's not going to make any mistakes. We trust him with that. That's not our job. That's his job. But ultimately, those who reject or stand opposed to the gospel of the Lord Jesus, the Scripture says, the reason it's such good news is because there's, there's bad news. When you oppose and reject it, that God will stand in justice against that. Would you bow your heads with me at all of our campuses and our campus pastors will take over from this point at the other campuses. If you're here and you've never before entrusted your life to Jesus and you said, you know what? 
I've realized today for the very first time that God's great love has been demonstrated to me that as a sinner I can't save myself and I realize that my only hope is in the justice that God has poured out on Jesus, the sinless one, on my behalf. And that I've been saved, I can be saved not by my own works, I can't do that on my own, but because of God having initiated that for me in Jesus. And so today I realize that I need to confess that I'm a sinner and I can't save myself and that I need Jesus to come live inside of me, to forgive me of my sin, to change my life. I need to enter into relationship with him. And I want to do that today. I don't know that I've ever really done that. And I want to do that today. If that's you and you're in this room or you're in the East Worship Center, would you just very quickly put your hand up in the air and say, hey, that's me. I, 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 I need to be sure of that relationship with with God through Jesus Christ. Just put it up in the air wherever you're at. And give me a moment as I look around this room. Even the East Worship Center, do the same thing as kind of a signal of what God's doing in your life. Thanks. If that's you, I want to encourage you that when we dismiss in just a moment that you come by the fireside room, it's in the atrium, it's clearly marked. I encourage you to come by there. Speak to one of our pastors, one of our prayer partners about what it means to enter into relationship with God through his son Jesus. Father, when we deal with heavy things like this, I thank you that, that your spirit can guide and give clarity and help us to understand the big picture. But God, I pray this would also be not only a testament to your great, incredibly high grace and your incredibly deep love, but it would also be, God, a motivation for us to be able to share your love with people around us that need you. Regardless of what happens to us, People around us need you. And I pray, God, you would place in our hearts a desire to see them come to know you. And that through every mean God, through every opportunity, we would share with them the love of Christ and the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus. So we trust you to help us to be that kind of people, a people who are sensitive to eternal things. And that we would always realize that the afterlife matters and that this life matters. So help us in this life to be a shining light for the glory of Christ. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.